Imagine, one early morning in July, in the cathedral quiet of the National Railway Museum in York. Imagine, if you will, taking one of the most treasured exhibits, considered by the curators priceless, and doing this to it. And you would be ginger about it too, firing up one of the greatest steam engines ever built. Imagine, too, where most you would want to take this engine. Not simply across the Vale of York, which is able and flat, but to one of the most spectacular railways in England. Sometimes, when the future is uncertain, the only horizon we can see is the one that recedes from us into the past. Then we tell each other things were so much better, and not just better, but grander and more exciting. Back then, no matter we can see it now only in fragments, the world was more complete. York Station, Saturday, July the 16th. Well, as you say, we're just about ready to depart now. So it will be headed going for a while. The 12 port is only equivalent to oh, four or five hundred tons. So it'll be hard work to uh, keep, maintain steam for a while until the firebox warms up. But once she is warmed up, we'll be away. It's um, a rocky ride to see you have the engine and the tender. And one foot on the engine, one foot on the tender, so I'm up and down like a yo yo. Fantastic. What, just, what's good about it though? Well, it's just a steam engine, and I'm a steam engine man. A4 Pacific No. 4468 Mallard was commissioned in 1936 and brought into service in March 1938. She cost the LNER £8,500 and was destined to become, as you see her, one of the great symbols of the steam age, to enthusiasts among the very queens of steam locomotion. There's a special story tied up in Mallard, which today came out of her static display at the National Railway Museum. She's drawing a train of amateur and professional experts who know the story inside out. But she'll be watched all day long from the trackside by people, some of them not yet born, when Mallard ended her actual working life in 1965. I'm listening for the exhaust sound of the engine when he's working, particularly when he's working hard. This 
this particular locomotive makes a very interesting sound because it's got what we call three cylinders. And the centre cylinder valve gear is driven by the piston valves of the two outside cylinders on what we call a conjugated motion. So you get uh, a fairly, well, not a completely even exhaust beat, which makes it a very interesting sound, particularly when it's working hard. about them stealing the train. <laughs> we're going to bring her back. We're going to put her on a 747. <laughs> She's going to be running in San Diego, so if you folks from Great Britain want to see her, come on over. <laughs> we have 60 people here over from the United States all over the country, and we're kind of what you call train nuts and we're overriding trains for two weeks here in the islands. What about this one? What about the trip? Well, this is a highlight of our trip. This is the one we're all looking for, and this is the halfway point on the trip, so this is it. I just find the whole thing relaxing. I had a good day out. I enjoy it. I like um, to make recordings because I like to listen to them later. Um, and some of it, I think, is quite historical now. It's sort of a bit like industrial archaeology in a way, I suppose. What makes Mallard so revered and so valuable today is something that happened when she was only five months into her service. On Sunday, July the 3rd, 1938, she smashed the world speed record for steam locomotion. The cynic might say, well, somebody had to do it. There are no cynics aboard today. I usually try and get my head out the window very early and take first spot. And I'm listening to the beat of the engine, the, move, the movement of the train, and I also like to take and times to just to see how fast the train is running. I keep a log of the whole trip and uh, actual times and book times and I write a few notes beside here and then I, I go home, I write that up in full. I'm from Australia, as you can understand, from Melbourne and I've taken two months of leave this year, took none last, took, so I could take two months this year to uh, travel behind Mallard. And I'm on this one and the next and the next two weeks. I take this for interest. It tells me how late the train's running or if it's running early. And I can go back and I can say to people, well look, yes, Ballard was supposed to be in at such and such a time. It, it left for three minutes late. It made up five or six minutes between, I think it made up, uh, well, at Leeds. Leeds, we, ma we made up uh, four, four minutes between York and Leeds. So. This is, this is all good stuff, this is interesting. Jack Pilgrim worked on the railways in Australia before becoming ordained and a chaplain to the Royal Australian Air Force. Another visitor from the Southern Hemisphere is Chris Gunn and his family from New Zealand. It's good to be able to say that you've travelled behind the world's fastest steam engine, I think. Uh, not many people can say that. And the reason why we like these train trips is because we meet a lot of nice people. We like everyone from England, they're all so friendly, and we like your accent. <laughs> Look at all the people out here. Look the side, do you think yeah. it was a royal procession? Can you hear that engine? I hear it is. She sounds lovely. Yeah, that's what we came here for. Very square. <laughs> you know what I mean by very square? Well, not in respect to an engine, what is that? Well, it means that the valve events are all in good order. The exhaust beats are coming out one after the other in their proper sequence. There's no syncopation. No, oh, it's great to have it. My greatest pleasure today is to relive a few memories of the line and to relive memories of 
to the back of Mallard because I had driven the engine. It was a, a thrill to drive the engine, to actually handle a regulator of the engine of the fastest steam engine in the world. And I said to my fireman, a tall man, all you're going to see is floorboards and fire holes. Oh, all right, Bert, he said, all right, because I was going to put the engine to it. And while I didn't do the fastest ever time in the Sawdry, to me, it was the quickest I'd ever done the trip. <laughs> Let's have a jubilee, let's have some singing to send all trouble on his way. Let's have in September 1935, in a fervour of patriotism, a fully streamlined service opened between London and Newcastle and immediately caught the imagination of the public. Streamlining. Now there was something modern, positive something to add to the pictures in children's encyclopedias. An A4 Pacific, pulling a train called the Silver Jubilee, acted out the words of the Carl Gibbons hit. It sent old trouble on his way in style. The novelty of speed started a craze the railway companies were only too happy to foster. The LMS weighed in with the Coronation Scott and its distinctive shape and livery. Was there one design ordained by the law of aerodynamics, or were we at the start of a style war? In France, the car designer Signor Bugatti was at it. In Germany, the redoubtable Dr. Krukenberg was pondering diesel electrics. There were great things at stake. To go fast, indeed, patriotic. Coronation Scott obliged with 114 miles an hour. The LNER struck back with the Gresley designed streamliner Coronation in its distinctive blue livery. A sales point, the Beaver Tail observation car. Mallard was built for this sequence of blue trains, but with a design feature that was quite novel. The secret was in the very guts of her and was a set of mods on existing workshop practice from France. America and Finland. And this was it, the double kill chap blast pipe, which, when brought together with a new chimney arrangement, drew air into the firebox and expelled the exhaust gases with a minimum loss of mechanical efficiency. If it seems in principle a crude enough technology, remember that flat out Mallard produced 3,000 horsepower from what is after all the parent idea of all steam engines, a boiling kettle. The big end. The bearings grew so hot that Gresley incorporated a stink bomb into the lubricating system to warn the driver when the whole lot was going critical. If you smelt something other than sweat and coal dust on the footplate, you were certainly overdoing it. Measuring the output were a very few gauges and the experience of the driver. Driver Duddington, assisted by fireman Tommy Bray, both good Doncaster lads, did the business on the record run. Joe Duddington to rail enthusiasts is quite as important a Yorkshireman as Len Hutton and he always told the story with a bit of style. Well, I gave Mallard her head, and she just jumped to it like a live thing. After three miles, the speed meter in my cab showed 107 miles an hour. Then, 108, 109, 110. Getting near Silver Jubilee's record of 113. Wonder if I can get us that. Well, we'll try. And before I knew it, the needle was at 116, and we got the record. Go on, old girl, I thought. We can do better than this. So I nursed her and shot through a little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, while they tell me the folks in the car held their breaths, 126 miles per hour. 126, that was the fastest speed a lo steam locomotive had ever been driven in the world.
The war put an end to steam records, and post-war ended steam, and the romance began. And what line more worthy for Mallard today than the most written about 72 miles remaining on the British rail network? A clue? The just passing Settle Station. go into a tunnel you, um, you you know you check your water level before you go into a tunnel in, in the boiler make sure that's all right and, and uh, if it's a long tunnel you, you make sure your fireman's injector working and, uh, and then you sort of half close your eyes because uh, it gets mucky in there you don't put your head outside and you hope that no one has taken the lines away because you can see nothing until you burst out the other end. Of course, you, you have to uh, give a long blast on a whistle before you enter the tunnel, and uh, of course, when you leave it. The Settle Carlisle is without question the most spectacular piece of civil engineering ever undertaken by the railways. 3,000 labourers were taken on in 1869, and 400 of them died in the construction. It's a museum of horrors, this beautiful and cherished line. Like all our history, a mixture of slur and utter grandeur. Inside the carriages, the stopwatches and charts are out for the approach to Dent Station. Mallard is giving the helicopter a run for its money. To meet the requirements of the day for a main line on which expresses would run, the rule gradient could not be greater than one in a hundred, nor the radius of the curve than that prescribed for fast running. In short, Settled Carlisle was a working main line that just happened to have all the romance of what we now call a scenic railway.
At Garsdale, Mallard stops to replenish her water. The passengers, dazzled by Ribblehead Viaduct, Bleemore Tunnel, Dent Head and Arton Gill Viaduct, Rise Hill Tunnel, get out at a thousand feet above sea level. Mallard's being cosseted. In the days of mainline running, there existed here the highest water troughs in the world, when thousands of gallons of icy water were scooped up in a few seconds. Moorcock Tunnel and still climbing. In steam, the game is really teamwork and experience between driver and fireman to encourage and coke the engine as a third personality, the she of affectionate railwomen, who mean by that a fiercely demanding mixture of fire and water. It's taken very hard physical work and complete concentration to bring Mallard triumphantly to this point. Aysgill, perfect image of a summit. The Settle Carlisle was only made possible because of the north-south alignment of the Ribble and the Eden Valleys. Although it was undertaken for the crudest of commercial reasons, on behalf of an enterprise now long buried in history, Mallard's transit of it, for all the pomp of the occasion, reminds us of the many thousands of workaday trains that did run on this spectacular, wonderful railway. To enjoy railways, 
is to enjoy something big and bold, something on the grand scale. And thousands, it is fair to say many hundreds of thousands, do enjoy this engine and this line as much as others might Covent Garden or Stratford. But then, to enjoy it is not to have to finance. Will we see this again often? Will our children grow up to show their children? Mallard is a very, very famous locomotive and it hasn't operated a great deal since it was restored into running order in 1986. And therefore, when Mallard goes over the Settle in Carlisle, there is a, a unique interest. And it is likely that the engine, uh, when it does its last run at the end of August in 88, uh, there's a strong possibility she may not run again because she will be out of uh, the necessary boiler certificate. The people that are on these four trips over the Settle in Carlisle railway have uh, really hit the jackpot. A good engine over a good railway, and of course, from my point of view as a, as a steam enthusiast, it's the, the one railway in the country that you can really extend a steam engine. But uh, if looking at it operationally, if they close it anyway, they've done away with a, one of the best diversionary railways from the operating point of view in the country. And uh, if they hadn't run it down in, in the past 20 years, it would still be one of the most or well, it would be on a par with the East Coast or the West Coast Main Line, really. But for many that day, Mallard over the settled Carlisle was a clear and unequivocal expression of what we're all coming to call our English heritage. In other words, it was agreed there are some things that money can't buy, like loyalty, feelings, a sense of history. And some things that only money can preserve, like those same abilities, feelings, and a sense of history. <laughs>